The Sanyong Rexton Ultimate is about half the price of a similarly specced Toyota Land Cruiser. And yet on paper, these two vehicles share many of the same core capabilities. So should you just bite the bullet, buy one and drive off into the sunset, and of course, pocket the change, or is it all too good to be true? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where stay in, new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Spoiler alert, okay? I did not, emphatically not, just say that this is a half-priced Toyota Land Cruiser, because that would be objectively nuts. If you're in the fortunate position where your budget is sufficiently robust to withstand the impost of a Toyota Land Cruiser, then I suggest you buy one because it's going to be objectively better. Maybe not twice as good in line with the price, but still objectively better. And likewise, if you are shopping the Rexton against a Mazda CX-8 or CX-9 or a Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento, and one of those four softer SUVs will do the job for you, then buy one of those because it will be more refined to drive around town and a much more civilized proposition. But if your budget is under 60 grand and you need that severe off-road capability and or really heavy tow capacity in line with the other best-in-class 4x4s, then you are shopping in, I'd suggest, exactly the right place. So come check it out. So the first thing to acknowledge here is the seven year warranty you get with this car. That's a confidence inspiring move. And ultimately, if history repeats, it played out pretty well for Kia in this country. In the four x four domain, you get the big ground clearance that translates to a big approach angle up there, a big departure angle down here and a good ramp angle in the center as well. It's a ladder frame with a body on top, not a monocoque like all of those softer SUVs. You get a a transfer case. It's got 4x4 low range, so just right for all of that slogging it out, rock hopping, all of the gnarly stuff, if that's what you want to do. There is a full-sized spare wheel and tyre down the back, together with a multi-link rear suspension set up with coils. There's 10 links in the multi-link and double wishbones up the front. So I think you'd agree that all of the 4x4 fundamentals are absolutely in place. Now let's talk about the powertrain. Time for another spoiler alert. Take a look, this is absolutely not a 4.5 litre Toyota Land Cruiser V8. It's actually about half that, but hey, you are saving 50 grand and the outputs are still quite respectable. 130 kilowatts peak power at 4,000 RPM and 420 newton meters kicking off at just 1,600 RPM. So there's nothing too shabby about that. And I've got no doubt that it would acquit itself with moderate distinction, at least towing its maximum 3.5 tonnes tow capacity. Not that I think you should tow three and a half tonnes with vehicles such as this, including all of the utes and all of the wagons derived from utes. It's kind of nutty to tow that much with a vehicle that weighs about two tonnes. But hey, currently there's no law against it, so you're allowed to do that. Anyway, the power from this Jigger is pumped into a Mercedes-Benz Tiptronic 7-speed automatic, and I'd have to say, after flogging this car today for about 200 kilometres on all kinds of different services, I'd have to say there's nothing wrong with the powertrain, and in particular, the isolation of the powertrain from the cabin is superb. Whoever did that attenuation job gets 13 out of a possible 10. They tell me that acoustic insulation treatment was a Pininfarina design execution. Impossible to fault that. Hashtag respect. This is gonna be a long report, okay? And it is aimed at you if you are thinking of spending mid 50,000 bucks of your own money on one of these Swiss Army knife type 
of vehicles, the one that does the lot, you know, the domestics, the adventuring, the touring, and the heavy towing, whatever. There's a lot to unpack here, particularly with a brand that's had its ups and downs and is virtually unknown, at least to some of you from a hands-on perspective. We'll jump out on the road in just a sec, of course, and I'll get to the good and bad points as well. And I will tell you some exciting news about the local suspension tuning that's coming up for Australia. That's all to follow in this report. But first, if you know naught about Sanyong and you're worried about what you might be getting into brand-wise, here is the definitive background briefing on that. Sanyong is 65 years old this year. The Rexton badge has been around for 18 years now, incredibly enough. And about 10 years before the first Rexton rolled off the line, back in 1991, Sanyong jumped into bed with Mercedes-Benz. They actually called it a technology partnership, unquote, But I get the distinct impression it was a one-way flow on the tech front. I don't actually think Ben's lapped up too much in-house Sanyong tech. But this alliance did give Sanyong access to some pretty cool engines and other Mercedes-Benz components. Unfortunately, Sanyong hit a bit of a financial speed hump after the GFC in 2010. The company was bankruptcy protected in South Korea and I take that to mean it's a bit like chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States. Anyway, the Indians, perversely enough, came to the rescue there in the form of Mahindra, which currently owns 75% of Sanyong after bailing it out eight years ago. There was a bailout bidding war, if memory serves, but Mahindra came out on top. So today, Sanyong is a South Korean subsidiary of Mahindra. According to the Korea Automobile Manufacturers Association, for 2017, Sanyong was the fourth largest car maker in South Korea. The top five hit parade goes Hyundai in pole position, then Kia, GM Korea, Sanyong and Renault Samsung. On a comparative scale, well, Hyundai has 66,000 employees and makes 1.7 million cars annually. Sanyong has almost 5,000 employees and makes 156,000 cars. That was for 2017. So Sanyong is roughly one-tenth the size of Hyundai. But it's still a sizable production volume. You know, if you join 156,000 cars nose to tail, you get a conga line of new Sanyongs stretching 700 kilometres. That's rather a lot of cars. You can't make cars competitively in that volume without all of the latest manufacturing technology. Of course, you also have to consider how the brand fits in here in Australia. Hashtag Straya. I mean, where else in the world would you find a man randomly with the ability, the drive, and the sheer engineering passion to put together a patchwork quilt rhinoceros built of nothing but old rusty sheet metal? And that is the kind of attitude that has put this country where it is today on the world stage, I'll have you know. Back to the Sanyong. Now, If you're thinking about parting with the big bucks, obviously there's a couple of big steps you've got to cross on the road to owning one of these babies. And the first one would be confidence in the brand. Clearly this is what the seven year warranty is all about. This is Sanyong's third crack at Australia, even though they've been here for donkey's years, you might think of them as an emerging brand. The first two cracks, not that successful, but I think they're pretty serious this time because this is the first time around the world Sanyong has set up a wholly company-owned international distributorship. And to me, more than anything else, that says this time we're serious, we're hanging in there. So there's that. And the second big hurdle for me would be if I'm gonna put 53 grand plus on road costs on the table, 
I really don't want to be procuring an exhibit from a freak show. I don't want to have to make excuses about the styling and start talking about how much I saved. Like, yeah, I know it's ugly, but I saved 50 grand. I don't want to go there. And thankfully, having walked around this car, and I know this is subjective and purely eye of the beholder stuff, but this is better than inoffensive from every angle. It is a completely cogent, holds its own styling exercise that says, yeah, I'm a serious off-roader and I'm not afraid to be me. So you don't have to make excuses about the styling and you don't have to look like you're, I don't know, on your way to Comic-Con or something. So that's a real plus. In analysing this vehicle, I wanted to break it down so that A, it made sense and B, it was as relevant as possible to as many people as possible who might be in the market for a Rexton Ultimate. And that is the people who don't want to step up to 100 or 110,000 bucks for a Land Cruiser 200 with the same fruit roughly. So in order to do that, I thought let's get three things on the table. And the first one of those things is what is a list of this vehicle's unequivocal strengths and then let's talk about the negatives but let's break them down into two categories right and the first category of negative is what are the negatives that I'd be prepared to trade off or wear as a consequence of saving the big bucks because it's not a small amount of money we're talking about saving here it's like 55,000 bucks and you'd have to make some compromises, okay? You've got to trade this off and that off, and you go, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I'll get rid of those things. I won't get them. I'd get them in a Land Cruiser, but I'm not getting them now, but I'm saving 55 grand. So let's get them on the table, and then let's talk about the last category of negative, which is the negatives that maybe you really don't want to wear at all, no matter what the saving. So here we go. The value proposition is pretty compelling compared with a Prado or a Land Cruiser 200. Rexton Ultimate is mid to late 50,000s on the road here in Shitsville. Fully loaded Land Cruiser is 120 grand. You could step down to the VX for about 100k and down again to a Prado Kakadu for mid to late 80s. These things are all fairly expensive toys. I'm not suggesting that there is even rough equivalence between a Cruiser and the Rexton, because there just isn't. But depending on your requirements in a vehicle, the Rexton may do the job that you need it to do for roughly half the cost, and that is significant. Rexton is close to the Prado Kakadu, however, on paper. The engine output's very close, Toyota with a slight edge there, but the Sanyong is 200 kilos lighter off the bat, and it has that Benz 7-speed auto against the Toyota 6-speed. There's slightly more ground clearance for the Rexton, although not much. That's versus the Prado. Slightly longer wheelbase, too. 535 kilos of payload capacity for the Prado, 727 for the Rexton. A sizable bonus there, I'd suggest, for outback touring in the Sanyong. Rexton also has 500 kilos more maximum tow capacity versus the Prado, and it's 30 grand cheaper ballpark. Plus, Rexton Ultimate is fully loaded. I won't bore you with the full list. It's pretty easy to download the specs. But the Rexton even gets Apple and Android phone integration standard, and you don't get that at all with the Toyota. In fact, if you want to buy a Prado for the same coin as a Rexton Ultimate, you'll be buying the base model shitbox GX manual, and I'm not sure that one even gets a friggin' steering wheel in standard form. I guess one of the key questions for many people in the market for a car like this is how does it drive? And I'd have to break that down for you like this. See, as a motoring journalist, I've driven lots of extremely high performance cars, lots of expensive off-roaders like Range Rovers and stuff like that. And I'd have to say that when you drive a Ferrari or a GT3 Porsche or BMW M, whatever, it's like sex with a supermodel syndrome because you have these expectations that it's gonna be like this. 
and sometimes those expectations are unreasonably high and the vehicle itself cannot hope to meet them no matter how good it is. I remember the first time I drove a Ferrari was like that. It was a 550 Maranello Ferrari. It was worth 500 odd thousand dollars at the time and at that same time my house in Sydney was probably worth about 375 or 400 thousand dollars. So this was a serious wedge of car and I'd never driven a Ferrari and I always lusted after it and I came away at the end of it thinking is that as good as it gets? I mean it was good, don't get me wrong, it just wasn't that good. And of course when you drive a Sanyong it's the converse situation isn't it? It's the opposite of sex with a supermodel because you have these inevitably low expectations and I'd have to say that the reverse is also true in the context of delivery, right? Because this car delivers more than I had hoped for. I was thinking it might be a bit crap, and it's actually a lot better than a bit crap. And when you break it down into its component parts, there are bits of its performance that are stratospherically impressive. See, the integration between the engine and the transmission is excellent it's really good I mean Mercedes-Benz seven-speed automatic how bad can it be answer not very it's superbly quiet the gear shifts are often imperceptible and you just come away impressed with the powertrain I know that the uh, outputs themselves are line ball with the Hyundai Kia 2.2 litre diesel so it's a good performer but it's not wound up as tight as say the Ford Ranger Raptor engine is that two litre twin turbo. It's not delivering like that, but it feels like it's delivering more than the peak output suggests. So that's pretty cool. I'd have to suggest also that the attenuation of the driveline from the cabin is superb. Like, you know there's an engine and a transmission down there, but it's really not intrusive at all. It's so well isolated from the cabin. Like in a performance car, you might not want that, but in a family SUV that you can drive off road, but let's face it, is gonna spend most of its time just ferrying the troops around from this engagement to that engagement. You don't want an intrusive engine transmission character thing at all. It's down there, it works, but you won't feel it most of the time. If I were going to hitch up and F off into the sunset, I'd want to know all about what sort of support I'm likely to receive if the chips suddenly go down. Like, will I get any at all, especially out there where it's all dingo piss and dust and reptiles that kill? Tim Smith, who heads up Sanyong in Australia, tells me that they're rapidly growing their dealer network and they are slated to hit 40 dealers nationally by June this year. There's roadside assistance with the Rexton for the full term of the warranty, which would be seven years, and there's no distance cap on the warranty either. You get unlimited kilometres. Sanyong Australia, the senior management there, assures me that their roadside assistance means everywhere in the country, no matter how remote you choose to go. And the service interval is 15,000 Ks or 12 months, whichever comes first. And that should make it easy enough to darken the door of a dealer at the right time in the service schedule, no matter how extensive an outback excursion you might be planning. So that's nice. They seem pretty serious, frankly, about looking after their customers. At least that's the philosophy of Sanyong Oz. 3.0 from the absolute top down. And I am in no doubt about that whatsoever. The one area where this car does absolutely meet what I expected it to deliver in terms of it being a Sanyong, and that's not absolutely a good thing, is in the overall dynamics, which is the way the car goes around bends, handles the bumps, and gives you feedback about what's going on. So the steering to me at times feels a bit dead and unresponsive, and at low speeds around town, there doesn't seem to me at least to be enough self-centering force going on, and I'd like those things to be improved because driver engagement is kind of important to me. I don't know if it's important to you, maybe you want to feel disengaged from the process, in which case 
the steering might not be one of those red flags, at least how it seems to you. The other thing is the dynamics package generally in terms of the suspension compliance. Around town, really not that impressive. Out on the open road, a bit better, but still not a world beater. I've got this golden rule about buying cars and I tell it to people all the time and like most of these deals that one attempts to strike with oneself, I try and not break it routinely. So here it is. Do not buy a brand new car with the intention of modifying it immediately just so it will do what you want it to do. And I guess that's what I'm talking about here with the Rexton and why potentially this car is a deal breaker for me. And it's this, okay, the majority of driving that I would do, and I think the majority of driving that many owners of vehicles like this, even the ones who go off-road routinely or tow some big heavy boat or whatever, most of the driving that people like that do tends to be around their homes. The vehicles serve a dual purpose. They're the family transport. They go to the shops, they pick up the kids. They also do all of that mundane domestic running around. And the suspension tuning on this car is awful at that. Now, let me just clarify this. I've driven this car on corrugated dirt roads now, patchwork bitumen quilts on the highway, on the freeway at 110, and around town. And it's terrible around town. Once you get it out on the highway, even on decent dirt, it's okay. But around town, it crashes over the slightest obstacle, you know. Someone drops a cigarette butt on the road and you go over it and all of a sudden you can feel every loose filling in your head. And then when you hit other defects in the road that the suspension responds to slower in the time domain, so less of that sharp shock thing and more of that wallowy stuff, it's okay at that, but it's terrible over every minor isolated geometric defect. And to me, it just feels over damped to buggery. So here's the current state of play on the local suspension tuning and development front for the Rexton. Captain's Log, star date 15 2019 Tim Smith, the boss of Sanyong Oz, tells me the Iron Man suspension dudes that he commissioned to make this ride quality frown go upside down have sent their recommendations to South Korea. So they're through phase one and two of the local process, apparently. They're tweaking an Australian spec Rexton over in South Korea now. Iron Man is also preparing a genuine lift kit for the hardcore adventure set, so that's nice if you're one of them. Compliance testing is underway there, and that kit is about two months away, apparently. I've got a bit of time for Mr. Smith, I have to say. He tells me, hopefully we can have a local tune by April production with a local change for existing customers. This will cost me money, but I may absorb this into the landed cost. I need to work out a way to keep the cost low for everyone. Bear in mind, okay, that April production means add two months for shipping and customs clearance and distribution and related stuff like that. I've got to give Mr. Smith full points on two fronts here. A, it's notoriously hard to get the factory to bother with stuff like this for low volume exports especially suspension tuning, which is typically a pretty hard sell because it's just not a priority in Southeast Asia. And he's probably not making a bunch of new friends back at the mothership over this demand. And B, not leaving existing customers up the creek with suspension that doesn't work very well on our roads. That's a plus. This is part of what leads me to conclude the brand is serious about being in Australia this time around. Interior styling, really very good. They have put a lot of thought into the presentation of all of this. Some brilliant quilting on the seats matched by quilting on the fascia for the dashboard. It's nice soft touch stuff. The metal look, polished thing, the brushed look, it really looks elegant as well. So a lot of thought and the execution visually really appeals. The button layout is complex, obviously, and it's going to take you a while to be familiar with all of that. But once you make friends with it, it's all perfectly logical. So that's nice as well. 
The seats are a bit firm up front. You might think, ah, oh, this is a bit hard if you only get one of those traditional, you know, 10 to 15 minute test drives. But I was in this car for two hours getting on location today and these seats got more and more comfortable as the drive progressed. And you often feel that way, you know, where they feel a bit firm up front, they're better for the long haul. So there's certainly that. When you step back into row two, it's quite comfortable back there as well. There's a lot of leg room. You get some good air conditioning vents for the kids. So very difficult for them to make a claim to the Human Rights Commission that you've, you know, flung them into Automotive Abu Ghraib or something. That's just not the case. When you get into row three, obviously there's some compromise in all of these vehicles in the third row, and I wouldn't want to sit in row three for any longer than was absolutely necessary, but hey, at least it's there. The access to row three is actually pretty good once you fold and roll the second row of seats, and they fold and roll pretty easily, but you do require a higher degree of manual effort to get them back into place afterwards. And obviously with seven bums on seven seats, there's not that that much room for luggage and this is the case with most seven seat SUVs so there's that. Styling as I said fantastic but there is a difference between styling and ergonomics so let's get into that now. If you're a bit hazy on ergonomics it's basically the execution of controls and visual displays and all that stuff, seats for human use so how well are they built for actual homo sapiens like us to use? And in that domain, I would give this interior 9 out of 10. And you might think to yourself, 9 out of 10 is a pretty good mark. What's wrong with that? And I'd suggest that extra 10% really makes a difference. Here's an example. When you're driving along, one of the most common actions is indicating when you change lanes or something, except if you drive a Mercedes-Benz. Unfortunately, these control stalks are a little bit too far away. When you've got your hands in place on the wheel, the tip of your finger only just makes it. And if they'd just gone to the effort of making these stalks 10 or 12 millimeters, call it half an inch, three eighths of an inch, closer to the wheel, that would make all the difference. And they're a little bit plasticky feeling as well in the way that, for example, the latest generation of Hyundai Santa Fe is not. So they could have put a bit more effort into the switch gear itself, especially the stuff that you use all the time. My favourite objection here is the steering wheel, and I detest it because it's so close to being perfect, right? The top two thirds of the wheel from here up is perfect, you know? The thumb rests are perfect. There's a nice ridge for your fingers to engage in for positive cornering when you're really trying. And if you're one of those Muppets who likes to drive at 10 and two, they haven't done a bad job with that either. And hey, it's a free country purely a personal choice. You can either drive at nine and three where the controls are and clearly where the ergonomics of the wheel are designed for maximum control, you know, diametrically across the axis of rotation, or you can be one of those halfwits who grabs the wheel like this. Like I say, it's your choice. I'm not prejudicial about that kind of thing. Anyway, that's all really good. The switch gear here is fine. The wheel itself is inoffensive. The piano black is nice. But this bottom third of the wheel, Sanyong, what were you thinking? The wheel's not even round here. There's a couple of bulges and they serve no purpose. There is an ideal shape for a steering wheel, right? It's a circle. And in a race car where a really skinny driver can only just get in under the wheel cause no doors, flat bottom steering wheel is fine, particularly because they're only ever doing this with their hands and they never have to reposition or feel the wheel spin through their hands when they're doing a U-turn or something. For a road car, the ideal shape is round and these bulges here eh, fail. I hate it. And also, this feels great. The section width of the wheel is really good and all of a sudden, when you grab this bottom third, it turns into one, not round in section, and two, it's just too thick to hold, and it's not even designed for a human hand, apparently. Perhaps there's a purpose. I just haven't been able to figure out what that is. In the trade-off department, okay, it's half the price of the Land Cruiser 200, 30 grand less than a roughly equivalent Prado, and for that sort of saving, you know, I can cop all of the deficiencies but one on the chin with this vehicle. 
like the steering wheel, few quirks, couple of bumps. The section width isn't constant around the periphery. <laughs> Who cares? Steering feels a bit dead. Okie dokie, like the Prado is some shining beacon of steering precision, right? I'm 30 to 60,000 bucks in front. And for most people, that is a hell of a lot of hoot. I'd be waiting for the local suspension tune to materialise because that's the big speed hump for me and I'd want to see what a difference that makes. It's not that far off either, it's only a matter of weeks. It has to be chalk and cheese, frankly, to make this vehicle viable at least for me. There's a subjective element to this determination, of course. It might be fine for you now, who knows? And then we got to talk about the chimes. Yes. Now, I loves me a good welcome chime as much as the next man, but it strikes me that one can have too much of even a very good thing. But wait, there's more. And that's to tell me that I'm not wearing the seatbelt, which uh, I'm not sure I need reminding of because I've just not yet put it on. I've decided to do that. I always like starting the engine first to let oil circulate and a bit of vestigial heat build up, but there you go. And also the car can't move because it's in park with the parking brake applied. And it knows that because there's so much computer this and computer that in a car, how can it not know? Anywho, let us get over the euphoria of Symphony in Welcome Chime Flat and pretend we've gone out for a nice therapeutic drive in which nobody has died and uh, we get back in one piece and we shut down the engine. I know. My favourite. That says goodbye, but can't wait to see you again, but that's not all. I like that one too. It comes with a message that says, turn it off to prevent battery drain. And I figured out that this is what happens when you flick the headlights down here to off, even though I leave them on auto and on auto, they turn themselves off anyway when you shut the engine down. So why do I need a reminder? I don't know that perhaps there is some kooky engineering logic of which I am unaware. But thankfully, do not let this cacophony of welcome and goodbye, it's so been so bittersweet chime, put you off buying one of these vehicles. I spoke to the PR and product planning dude at Sanyong, a guy I have known for some time, and he tells me that when you dive down into the menu system of this car, you can actually attenuate the crap out of all of these chimes to the point of virtual non-existence. So that's nice. I'd be doing that before I left the showroom floor, frankly. Okay, so weighing this all up, here's the bottom line. I'd be comparing a Rexton Ultimate to a Mitsubishi Pajero Sport Exceed, and I would specifically test drive both back to back if I were you after that local suspension fix is implemented on the Rexton. I never thought I'd say this, okay, but the Sanyong is actually the better looking vehicle here, not for two decades. Have I dreamed of saying that, but there you go. They're both excellent value, those two, and very close on capability, specs, and pricing. Of course, the Mitsubishi is a far better known brand, but itself facing a bit of upheaval with the integration into the vortex of Renault Nissan black hole Ness coming up. Who knows what will happen in there? And Pajero Sport is basically a converted Triton ute, so not itself a world champion contender in the refinement sweepstakes. There are more unknowns with the Sanyong, obviously. The reality of support is still unknown. I'm sure the best of intentions are currently in play. Resale value, well, that's a bit of a roll of the dice too, isn't it? But you are enjoying a considerable saving over a Prado Kakadu up front. So there's that. Even with the Southeast Asian spec suspension, you can see the product has huge potential when you drive it just for a few minutes. I guess the challenge for Tim Smith and his management team lies in making the brand itself viable in Australia, turning it into a household name and then pumping up the volume to be in a better negotiating position with the factory in future. That's not going to be easy or quick, I'd suggest. 
They're going to have to sell aggressively to succeed here because there's no shortage of choice in this segment, which is actually great news for you when you think about it, if you've got the cash in a somewhat depressed new car market here in Australia overall. I hope this report helped you make the right choice. Thanks for watching.